Well, good evening, folks. It's good to see you uh, out tonight. We're a bit uh, lower on numbers tonight. As you know, the uh, Baptist Missions Night uh, is on past the baton in um, Balnehinch uh, Baptist Church. But it's great to have Pastor McBratney along with us as he uh, finishes up on his series on the seven churches in Revelation. And we're looking forward uh, to your ministry this evening. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to hand over to Pastor McBratney now. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the grace of a new day, Lord. We uh, look out in creation. We see the, uh, the weather and the elements, Father. We see the might and the force of those elements. Lord, we see spring at this time with flowers bursting into bloom. We see all of it has intelligent design. All of it has a creator. All of it has a, a mark of your hands upon it, Father. And we acknowledge afresh this evening uh, of you, the creator God, of you, the one who created all things, but also created us and created us with purpose and in your image, created us to be in communion with you, Father. And we uh, thank you for that communion that we enjoy because of what Christ has accomplished. And we pray that you would uh, teach us from your word this evening, Father. We uh, pray and thank you uh, for the ministry of Pastor McBradley over these number of weeks. And we pray that uh, we would continue uh, to walk in your truth, Father, that we would continue to seek to apply your word to our hearts. And where your word specifically challenges us as your people, both individually and corporately together, Father, we pray that we would have enough grace in our hearts to humble ourselves, to ask for forgiveness, Father, and to seek to serve you and worship you and praise you. Father, we pray that as we uh, listen to your word now and as we come in a short time to prayer, that you will bless our time together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, the, fu the funeral for uh, Margaret Gray, um, as you know, is on Friday uh, at uh, in Gray's funeral home, at Margaret Stewart, sorry, um, in Gray's funeral home on Friday at 10 a.m. Um, for your information, so if you uh, are able uh, to attend, uh, I know the family uh, would appreciate uh, your attendance. Pastor McBratney will be uh, conducting the funeral there. Well, it's good to be back again with you tonight, and I again appreciate the opportunity of sharing God's Word with you. Um, we're going to read in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and the third chapter, um, from verse 14 to the end. But while you're finding the place, let me say that, in all honesty, I have found this series a hard series, and uh, I think perhaps one of the reasons for that is that I had forgotten just how poor spiritually these churches were. Ephesus had left their first love. Uh, Sardis was living on its reputation. And tonight, Laodicea was lukewarm. And as if that were not sufficiently poor and bad, uh, the churches in Thyatira and Pygamos were into immorality and, and adultery. Such things should not be anywhere near the church of God nor the people of God. But we're in Revelation, we're in chapter 3 and verse 14 to begin with. And the word of God reads like this. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, but I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, 
and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And God will add a blessing to the reading of his own inspired and infallible word tonight. Laodicea was built by Antiochus II. And strangely, it was named after his wife. Because that seems to have been a common name for women in that time and generation. I don't imagine any woman or young girl today would fancy being called Laodicea, but that's what it was. It was a banking center that brought great wealth to Laodicea. It had a famous hospital, a medical school, and it was famous for its eye salve called Celerium. It was also noted for the manufacture of rich garments made of a glossy black wool. And the high percentage of the wealthy people were those who had the, the animals, the sheep that made the black wool and produced that black cloth. There are two main points that we're going to look at tonight. Uh, the first one is we're going to look at Christ, and then we're going to look at the church. In verse 14 we read, And to the angel of the church, or messenger of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen. The Amen. And that word simply means, so be it. And the interesting thing is that whether the language is Hebrew or Greek or English, it has the same spelling all the time. A-M-E-N. But it is not always translated as A-M-E-N. You remember in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus came to the Lord Jesus, Jesus uh, and he said, you know, we know that you're a prophet come from God, for no one can do these things that you're doing. And Jesus said unto him about being born again before you can enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you have an authorized version, it says this, truly, true, uh, sorry, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. If you have a new King James version, like I have tonight, it is translated, most assuredly, I say unto you, you must be born again. And if you have an English Standard Version, which has become very popular, it is translated, truly, truly, I say unto you. But the message is clear and simple. It is reliable, dependable, authoritative. We can depend upon it. Now, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, he said this, All the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God. Now, you and I understand tonight through life's experiences that the promises of man and woman are easily broken. And I'm sure we ourselves, perhaps on some occasion, broken a promise. My wife has a very trusting spirit and a very trusting heart. She phones up someone in the morning and uh, with some request or some question or other, and the lady at the other end of the telephone invariably says to her, well, that's fine, I will check it out and ring you later on today. And about 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, my wife says to me, that girl never rang again. And I say, I didn't expect her to, because people just don't do that. People say things very casually, very carelessly, with no intention of following through, with no intention of keeping their word. Well, let me tell you this tonight. The promises of God are true. The promises of God cannot be broken. And because of that, in all our lives tonight, in the days in which we live, in the difficulties that perhaps some experience, 
There is no need for doubt or fear. No need for doubt or fear, first of all, about the past. You see, when you came to personal saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins were forgiven. They were forgiven by God, and they were forgiven forever. The Bible tells us that Jesus paid the totality of our, for the totality of our sins when he took our place and died on that cross at Calvary. The little chorus, I think it's a chorus, says, he paid a debt he did not owe, I owed a debt he, I could not pay. And I want us to understand this tonight. All the sins of the past, they're gone. All the sins of the present, they're gone. And all the as yet uncommitted sins of the future, they're gone. God says, your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 10, 17. Now that's reassuring, isn't it? You see, when you and I were born into the family of God through faith, we experienced salvation. God's salvation. <clears throat> John says that we were born into the family of God as the children of God. We weren't born as adults, so to speak. We were born as children. Peter says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. But when God saved us, there was not only the question of our salvation, but there was the question of our adoption. Now, that happened at the same time. But it's an entirely different truth and it's an entirely different situation. You see, when we were saved in salvation, we were born as children into the family of God. When we experienced adoption, uh, we were placed into God's family as adult sons. In other words, the moment we were saved, we then entered into the benefits and blessings of being a child of God. Paul says we are the heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. When did we become that? The moment you accepted Christ as your Savior. You were not only born in, into the family in salvation, but you were adopted into the family as an adult son, having privileges and responsibilities as an adult son. We have the privilege of prayer. You and I uh, can go to God at any time, in any place and under any circumstances and lift our hearts in prayer and praise and adoration and requests and so on to him. We can have the privilege of service. God has given to each one of us a gift to use and that's the privilege we have. But we have not only privileges, we also have responsibilities. But in our responsibilities, we are aided by the indwelling Holy Spirit. I could not do what I am doing without that Spirit of indwelling and abiding and helping. You cannot do what you endeavor to do without that same enabling of the Holy Spirit of God. So there's no concern about the past. It's gone. And then there need be no concern about the present. Because, you see, we have God's glorious promises. We're going to look very simply and very quickly at three of them. One, we have the promise of his presence. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And what an amazing promise to have. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you are a Greek student, which I am not, and never was and never could be, I understand that that's the strongest negative in the Bible. In other words, what he said was this, I will never, 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 never leave you. To the power of five. Now, a young minister told an old lady in the Scottish Highlands that, and she, he thought she'd be very impressed. And she looked at him rather disdainfully, and she said to him, Young man, you might need five nevers, but one's enough for me. And that's true, isn't it? We don't need never, never, never. Jesus said, I will never forsake you. Now, there are times in life when it's a comfort to have a friend, isn't it? Maybe you weren't feeling well, 
and you've been to the doctor and he sent you to the hospital and you've met the consultant and a few weeks, hopefully a few weeks have passed, not months or years, and um, you get a phone call from his secretary and he says, Mr. So-and-so, your consultant, wants to see you on Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. And you're concerned and you're anxious and you're worried and you can't sleep and you're wondering all about what is going to happen. Is it good news or not good news or even very bad news? And you have a friend who comes along and says, well, I'll go with you. That's a help, isn't it? I'll go with you. May not be able to do much, but I'll be there. And that's a comfort in that situation. Or maybe at times of family loss, the loss of a husband, a wife, a father, a son, or a daughter. It's a comfort when the, the family rally around and they come together. Quite often they come from far away because you're family. And that's a comfort to have them too. But you see, we have the promise of Christ's presence with us, guaranteed at all times. He will never leave us. And it is also guaranteed under all circumstances. When Paul was standing before those who were putting him on trial, he said this. He said, at my first answer, all forsook me and fled. And that was Paul in a bit of a dilemma. He's on his own, and all, all the odds are stacked against him. And then he adds in 2 Timothy, but the Lord, nevertheless, the Lord stood with me. And that's the experience that you and I can have. You see, we need to understand that our family might leave us sometime. There might be problems in the family. David had problems with his family. He had a son called Absalom who was a bit of a rebel, who sought to take David's place to usurp the kingdom, set David off the throne, and establish his own rule and kingdom. And David was writing in Psalm 27, and I don't know if he was thinking of this or how it happened, but here's what he said. He said, Psalm 27, verse 10, When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. You see, that's the promise tonight. Now, breakups and fallouts happen in human families. They happen in the families of the unsaved, which is sad and tragic, and they happen in the family of the saved, and that's even more sad and tragic. You see, there was a breakup in Jacob's family, wasn't there? Joseph's brothers refused to speak to him. They absolutely despised him. They wanted nothing to do with him. And the root problem there was favoritism. Jacob idolized Joseph above all the others, and he turned his brothers against him. He made him special. He had that coat of many colors. And favoritism is a bad thing in a family. Through God's grace, it is our responsibility to try to treat all our children exactly the same. But there are some parents who get it confused and mixed up, and they, when visitors are in, they might say, well, John, he's very clever, but Tom's not so clever. Bad mistake. Or, John's saved, but Tom, no, he's not saved yet, you know? Not good parenting. And, you see, so there's breakup in Jacob's family through favoritism, and there was breakup in Moses' family through jealousy. You see, Moses is the leader, and Miriam and uh, Aaron, his brother and sister, they came to him one day and they said, Moses, what about us? We have as much authority as you have. But they were wrong. God had not given them the authority that he had given to Moses. And there was jealousy. And the Bible says that jealousy is as cruel as the grave. It's an awful sin. And it's a soul-destroying sin. And so there may be trouble like that in the family. Now, as a, a very slick and quick summary, if you ask me to um, sort of pin it down a bit more today, I would say this. It seems to me that trouble in the family is caused by one of three things. Marriage, money, and misunderstanding. Now, let me explain that. Marriage. <clears throat> in our province, we have seen this happen 
time and time again. I'm thinking not right now to explain this to you of a family, a Christian farmer, and his son uh, married a Roman Catholic girl. And his father cut him out altogether. That was the problem. Ouch. And then sometimes the breakup is the result of money. You know, I have been in situations where um, someone has died and I've been in the home where the family are, and unbelievably there is a discussion and a dispute, and quite heatedly sometimes, about who the father intended to get that and who he intended to get that and so on. And it's all about money. The man has just died. I was in a home one day when I was in Lisburn. The phone rang one morning. The message was, Pastor, my, my dad has died. And I went to the home. I was there in 10 minutes because it was in Lisburn. And when I got there into the home, two of his daughters were arguing about who should get the father's car. These are professing Christians. And the third will need a bit of explanation, misunderstanding. And by that I mean misunderstanding of the scriptures. I'm thinking now of a situation that I am aware of over in England. There's a lady there. She's a godly lady, but she's never seen her grandchildren. But the grandparents on the other side of the family, they see, she sees them all the time. And she only lives 100 yards down the road. Why the difficulty? Why the problem? Well, because when this lady married, she left the exclusive brethren. And none of the family speak to her, acknowledge her, or anything like that. At the first, she started to uh, try to send birthday presents to the children, the grandchildren. They were returned unopened. These are men and women who take upon themselves the name of Jesus. And this is how they behave. Is it any wonder the world has turned away from religion and Christianity and Christ? Going outside the things that I have personally experienced, there was a, a young man in a Jewish family who got converted. And he was doing well. But there was a visitor to the family, and he asked the father, he said to the father, where's your son? And the father said, my son is dead. You see, there weren't very many professions in the early church because most of the converts were Jewish and if you identified with Christ, you were ostracated, you were cast out, you were cut out of all the will and all the inheritance. It really meant something to come to Christ and it really cost something. But misunderstandings, marriage, money, and misunderstandings. Your family might leave. The Lord Jesus talked about a day when father will turn against son and daughter will turn against mother and so on. The second thing is this, your friend might leave. I imagine that Paul and Barnabas were very good friends. Certainly early on in their experience, but they were torn apart over John Mark. Did you ever imagine that Wesley and Whitfield would separate? They were the best of friends. They were working together gloriously in the gospel in ministry, but they, they, they separated over doctrine. There was a difference in their doctrine, and they separated. His presence at all times, his peace. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you, do we find ourselves tonight that the hymn writer was true? Do I believe what he said? He said, Oh, the peace my Savior gives, peace I never knew before. See, one of the blessings of salvation is this. We can have a deep, settled peace in our heart in the most trying and in the most difficult situations that we face. You see, the peace of God is not dependent upon our circumstances. There's a peace that is real. It's not a put on, it's not a show. There is a real deep sense of peace. 
There's a peace that we can have that cannot even be understood by the unsaved. A peace that passes understanding. There's a hymn in the Songs of Victory book. It's 350. Here's what it says. I'll read a few verses. Peace, perfect peace. In this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. And then down a few verses. Peace, perfect peace. Our future all unknown. Jesus we know, and he is on the throne. Peace, perfect peace, death shattering us and ours. Jesus has vanquished death and all its powers. It is enough, each struggle soon shall cease. And Jesus calls us to heaven's perfect peace. The peace of God that passes knowledge and understanding. I was told there was a glass of water in the pulpit and uh, I left it and I picked up that, but it was on the other side. That wouldn't work too well. <clears throat> we have his presence, we have his peace, and then we have his provision. Paul told, God told Paul, my God shall supply all your need. And in this I just want to remind you of the hymn that says, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. There's no concern about the past. There should be no concern about the future, nor should there be any concern uh, about the present, nor the future. You see, the future is guaranteed. At death, the soul departs the body. On Friday morning, we will put the body of Margaret Stewart down into the ground. But yesterday morning, the spirit and soul left the body and went instantly into the presence of God. There's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's no soul sleep. It is absent and present. As quick as that. In a moment of time. And that body will remain there until the Lord comes. And then there will be a resurrection and a glad and glorious reunion. He is the Amen. But then it says here also that he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, the Jehovah's Witness say, well, he, he was a created being. And it almost sounds like that, doesn't it? He is the beginning of the creation of God, the first of God's creation. No, no, that's not what it means. And so my responsibility tonight is to show you from the word of God that Christ always existed. And I do it this way. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, those first important words says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Hebrew word El, E-L, is a singular word. That means just one. But the plural of that is Elohim, and that means three or more. In English, you have the singular one and the plural two or more. In Hebrew, you have the singular one, the dual two, and the plural three. So in the beginning, God, and that's the word Elohim. Three times, three people. In the beginning, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit created the heavens and the earth. I can show you that the Father was active in creation. Psalm 102, verses 24 and 5 says, O oh my God, L, singular, one person. O oh my God, you have led the foundations of the earth. That's God the Father. In John chapter 1 and verse 3, you have God the Son. Jesus, all things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. Colossians 1 says, by him, Christ, all things were created in heaven and in earth. And I can show you the Spirit was active in creation. Job 26 verse 13 says, by his Spirit, he adorned the heavens, created the stars, and so on. The Trinity was involved in the creation. There are similar phrases like this 
Genesis 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's the beginning of the physical universe. There was a moment when there was nothing there. And then God spoke. And God called it into being. God called it into existence by the word of his power. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1, which I'll read to you if I can find it quickly. Here's what John says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That's the beginning of the public ministry of the Lord Jesus. John says, look, we were there. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. And then in John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the word. Well, that takes you back to the pre-existence of Christ. It says, the word was with God. The word, were, <clears throat> the word was there is the imperfect tense, which means a continuation in the past. The Lord Jesus Christ has always existed. He is from eternity to eternity. He is the beginning of the creation of God. He is not the first created being. He is the creator itself, along with the Father and the Son. So let's think now about the church. Smyrna was the exception, of course, among these churches, wasn't it? The other six were pretty poor. In Ephesus, they had left their first love. In Sardis, they were living on its reputation. Laodicea was lukewarm. Now, how did Christ feel about, how Christ felt about this church? What he knew? He said, I know your work. You know, we need to be very careful. All of us, some of us more so than others, and I would be in me more so than others. One night, Elvin and I, when we were in America, were invited out for supper to a couple, and we were discussing uh, around the table what this man did. He said, well, I said to him, what do you work at? Well, he said, I build engines, build engines. But he says, I work in the night shift. And I build the engines, and uh, he says, actually, I spend most of my time looking at the television. I said, how, how can you build an, en an engine and look at television? Oh, he says, I have built so many, I could build them with my eyes closed. You see, something like that becomes routine. And there is a possibility and the danger that something spiritual becomes routine. It's hard to believe that we can become routine in our work for God. Paul advises and counsels us that we be vigilant at all times. We have an enemy who is stronger than we are, and um, we need to be careful. That's all I'm going to say on that, except to remind you what John Wesley said. John Wesley said, if I had a thousand lives, I would give them all to Jesus. And that's a good way to live. <clears throat> One more point than that before I move on. I was looking recently at the uh, figures in the 2011 census for Bangor. The recent one hasn't been published yet. This might surprise me, so I, it may surprise you. In 2011, there were 61,000 people living in Bangor. 61,000. So there must be much more than that now because it has grown immensely since then. And what I want us to understand and um, ask the Lord to help us in this is 90% of them, certainly 85% of them, are not saved. And we are here to be a light in a very dark place. I think we haven't fully appreciated yet the damage that COVID has done to church and churches. It practically stopped all kinds of outreach for two years, and people have got used to church at home. But that's not how the Bible expects it to be. The Bible says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. I read a story one time of a young man who was attending a church, and then he had gone missing for a few weeks, a couple of the men went round to see him and the days were now of the open fire, you know, and cold on the fire. And they said to him, why, you, why have you stopped? And he said, well, you know, I, I just, there's no power in the church. I don't, you know, things aren't, uh, 
And one of the men took the tongs and they lifted one coal out of the fire and they set it on the grate. And before long, the red flame faded away and they began to smoke. Coals were made to burn together and Christians were made to meet together and work together and pray together. And we need to remember that. And we need to encourage those who haven't found perhaps the courage yet to come back because there is still in some people's hearts and minds a bit of fear just in case they get COVID. But we should try to encourage them to come again and have fellowship with God's people. Now, what did Christ say about the church? Well, he said, you're neither cold nor hot, you're tepid, lukewarm. I remember when we first went to America, we had to be careful if we went into a restaurant and uh, with other people out of the mission and so on. You had to be careful if you wanted tea, you had to be careful to say, hot tea, please. Because, you see, if you didn't say hot tea, they would bring you iced tea. And iced tea is not to my taste. Tea is meant to be hot, not cold. You see? So that's, that's the idea. He said, you're tepid, spiritually cold. I'm running out of time, so I'll hasten it. Demas was spiritually cold. He was a child of God, but he was spiritually cold. He lost interest in the things of God and took a greater interest in the things of the world. In fact, I think he probably became very successful. He used to be faithful, but then he was missing sometimes, and then a bit more and a bit more. Not going to labor that. Spiritually cold, Demas. Spiritually lukewarm would be John Mark. John Mark was doing well, and then there was a time in his life when the edge dropped off and he was lukewarm. Thankfully, both he and Demas were restored back into fellowship with God and his son. Spiritually hot. Men and women, uh, those who are spiritually hot are men and women who live their lives in the will of God, who live their lives according to the word of God and who live their lives in prayer to God. And Paul is an outstanding example of that, isn't he? In three areas. First of all, his supplication. He was a man of prayer. It was real, intense, earnest prayer, wasn't it? He wrote to the Colossians. He said, I want you to know what great conflict I have for you. This wasn't, Lord, bless the people in Colossae. This had intensity and reality and sincerity. And that's how we need to pray. And then his sufferings. He said that we are to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and he certainly did. Most of you will know 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's an abbreviation. He said, five times I received 40 stripes save one. The save one means this. They, they didn't give you the last one in case they had miscounted and gave you one more than they should have given you and that would have been a fault. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've said this before. I may well have said it here. I can assure you of this. I would only ever have been shipwrecked once. I would never have got on a ship again. Three times I was shipwrecked Night and the day I spent in the deep. And then in the service, what did he say? He said, I worked harder than anyone else. He wasn't boasting. It was genuine. That's what he was. Now, there was no condemnation of this church. There were no doctrinal errors. There was no evident or obvious sin. It was just that they had got a bit cold and a bit careless, and that needed to be corrected. <clears throat> See, here's a church, and they felt comfortable about itself. They said, I'm modernizing. We have lots of money. We have great buildings. We have important people. We have large congregations. We have everything that we need. What do we need to do? But you see, because the church has large numbers, there's no guarantee that God's pleased with them. Large numbers are just that, large numbers. Corinth was a large church. Um, uh, let me get this turned over. 
Corinth was a large church. It had many talented people. Let me read a verse to you, if I can find it quickly, which I think I can. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26. Where am I? He says, How then is it, brethren, whenever you come together, listen to this, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. They were jumping up all over the place. But there were serious divisions in the church, weren't there? And there was the grace of immorality allowed and permitted and even condoned in the church. And there was disaster in the church because they came to the Lord's table drunken. My last word to you is this. Chapter, four, chapter 3, verse 20 in Revelation. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Now, let me explain this to you first of all. This is not a gospel appeal. Not a gospel appeal. Thousands of preachers have preached the gospel from behold, I stand at the door and knock. I myself have done so. But this is not what it's about. It's not a gospel appeal. Secondly, it is not a church appeal. This is a personal appeal. The Lord Jesus addresses the members of the church individually who have misplaced Christ and put him on the periphery rather than on the center, put him on the circumference, and he says, okay, here's the situation. Here's the ideal. I'm standing knocking. And if you open the door, I will come in. And so that leaves us with one last word. Here we are in what I'm calling Joshua territory. You see, Joshua brought the children of Israel down into a valley. And on one side of the valley was Mount Ebal. And over that mountain lay the land of the Amorites and the gods of the Amorites. And on this side was Mount Gerizim, and over that mountain lay the land of Israel and the God of Israel. And they're down in the valley, and they're going to make a decision. And here's Joshua's plea. Here's what he says. He says, as for me, I will serve the Lord. And that's what Revelation 3.20 is about. It's not a gospel appeal. It's not a church appeal. It's a personal appeal. Where am I going to put Christ in my life? on the circumference, or in the center, or maybe look warm, somewhere in between. Now, I've covered a lot of ground, and I commend you to God and his grace. I'll close up here, and Chris will come forward. May God bless his word.